Hello and welcome to the latest in the series of the IHS uh, research seminars. The title of today's seminar is the evaluation of user care involvement in planning mental health services. However, before I ask my colleagues here from the Institute to introduce themselves, for those people who would like to participate in the discussion, I have a phone number and an email number. The phone number is 01752 233 646. And to email into the studio, it's tvstudio at plymouth.ac.uk. I'd now like to ask my colleagues to introduce myself, um, Alan. Hi, my name's Alan Miles, and I'm an academ academic coordinator for the Cornwall site, and I've been the researcher of this project. Hi, I'm Mary Watkins, head of the IHS, and the research director for the project we're discussing this afternoon. Hi, I'm Andy Dickens and I'm a research assistant for the Institute of Health Studies and I was a research assistant for this project. Thank you. Um, so before we start again the, um, the, the seminar, just to remind people of the phone number and the uh, email number. The phone number is 01752 233 646 and the um, email address is tvstudio at Plymouth dot ac dot uk um, and on with the seminar thank you hi uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the evaluation of user care involvement in planning mental health services as an introduction south and west devon health authority agreed in the winter of 2001 to set up a project addressing user and care involvement as a response to the seven standards of the NSF for mental health. The Health Authority were keen for the project to be evaluated and that it was conducted by an independent body and consequently approached the IHS. Although it was a two-year Health Authority project, our evaluation lasted for 22 months from January 2001 to October 2002. We were aware that this prevented us from evaluating the final outcomes with the objectives. However, this was necessary so that we could deliver the report to the Health Authority on time. The Health Authority had achieved a range of work with users and carers prior to the project, but this was seen as an opportunity to bring together people to gain a greater understanding to feed back to the larger community. The steering group consisted of all stakeholders, user and care representatives and commissioning managers. The purpose being to trial various methods of achieving user care involvement and to facilitate user care involvement with external organisations such as the local implementation groups and teams. The aims of the evaluation project were to collect data, analyse the data and make recommendations for future user care involvement. From our literature review, there were four key pieces of work. Edwards highlighted a paradigm shift in the 1990s in terms of representation whereby users were seen as participants in their care rather than the subjects of it. This shift in policy is also evident in various papers such as the NHS plan and shifting the balance of power. Goss and Miller identified five levels of involvement. No involvement, consumer education and marketing services, a limited two-way communication, organisations listening and being responsive. And finally, partnership. 
The issue of representativeness is described by Hopton, who states that all users must be involved, as service users aren't homogenous. And Forrest et al. states that if only certain individuals are involved, they may be seen as expert users and carers by others, whilst not representing general consensus. And best practice is highlighted by Goss and Miller in terms of involving users and carers right from the beginning of all process. Having small groups, not large groups, and achieving regular breaks. Setting realistic objectives and time frames. After all, involvement is time consuming. So turning to the methods, in terms of non-participant observation, we wanted to observe the steering group in action to establish exactly how the group interacted and how decision making was achieved. Our semi-structured interviews would allow us to collate different data to that from the observations and explore members' perceptions of the steering group and the impact they were having. For documentary analysis, we needed to look at all communication between the group in order to gain a greater understanding of the relationship between group members and the relationship that the group had with the project worker. So taking non-participant observation first. Initially we planned for two researchers to jointly observe the group, to observe the meetings, with one observing the group interaction and the other recording the discussion. However, at the first meeting, it was apparent that members were not comfortable with this. They found the environment too intimidating. They agreed that one researcher could attend, and this improved the situation. I think this impressed upon us right from the start that unless we worked closely with the steering group on terms acceptable to both parties, um, we would not be able to achieve the evaluation. Sociograms recorded interactions which offered graphical representations of each meeting. It showed who spoke to who and for how long and which members were dominating and which members were quiet. We used the groups meeting minutes to add context to these sociograms, offering a fuller picture. In our interviews, we wanted to pilot the draft interview schedule and also assess the competency of researchers and felt that a role play would be best for this. We approached the region's user development worker, resulting in him and two paid service users to volunteer to take part. The role play took place here at the host centre and the volunteers reviewed interview schedule and our interview skills. The video clip you're about to see is an example of what took place. Um, my second question is, um, can you think of any potential problems which may be caused by this form of um, joint working between the health authority and representatives of users and carers? And if so, what are they? Well, I think it's kind of to see people as representatives is quite a difficult and quite a dangerous area um, because people are very much services as all just you know, individuals in some ways, and to try and have one person or a group of people representing them, I think is quite a problem, mm -hmm. and how you decide and to what extent they are representative. Um, I think also the, um, the joint working, whether you actually achieve much work together or whether you'd actually achieve more if you had service users as more of a, a lobbying sort of group, as a sort of political analogue, sort of like maybe more sort of outside and not trying to sort of particularly if things are going to be done that service users are un unhappy with, to what extent they want to be associated with that and how mm. they're going to be seen by other service users. Um, right. So the, sec the second part to that question is um, what could be done to maybe alleviate some of these problems? <laughs> Perhaps, but I, I mean, I think that 
you know, making it clear about what sort of things service users can actually achieve in terms of their involvement. To what extent they're limited by, you know, the, the views of other people. Um, trying to make um, it c clear that people you know, are, you know, the representativeness is, is is kind of an issue. But I don't know how you're going to solve that. But I mean, mm. trying to discuss ways of making it fair, or, or just saying well, we're not, we're just going to, we're just going to pick people on merit. I mean, I think. It's, there's at least some discussion about mm. the issue. My next question is similar to that last yeah. one, which is what changes do you expect to come about as a consequence of being a member of this group? Well, I think the big changes I mentioned won't come about, like banning ECT um, and the change of maybe little bits about making people more aware about opportunity or alternatives will happen and maybe changing minds. And I think some of the smaller things may happen. Um, in terms of improving the quality of, of services, but I think a lot, it, it won't be, it would take, be quite difficult for this group to make really big changes. As you could see, the comments made by the volunteers revo resulted in, a, in, in helping us revise our schedule and uh, were of great assistance. Users and carers were not willing for the interviews to be audio recorded, and there was a separate schedule for the manager interviews, but these were recorded. Documentary analysis. The project worker used various methods of communication with all steering group members, namely emails to distribution lists, face-to-face -face visits and uh, to all individuals and groups. This enabled us to collate all the communication material used and understand the full role of the project worker. I'm now going to hand you over to Andy Dickens to discuss the results and the recommendations. Okay, okay thank you very much, Alan. Um, as he said, I would like to go on to discuss the results of our evaluation as, as well as the, uh, the, the main findings and the main recommendations that we made from that. Before I go on to that, I would just like to emphasize um, that our, our project evaluated the steering group, which was made up of users and carers who were there to influence health authority purchasing. I think that's a, a very important point and probably one that we will come back to later on. Um, in terms of the results, from the data collated, we actually collated the user carer interviews, the manager interviews, as well as the non-participant observations. Uh, from that, we realized that there was, there was a high degree of commonality between all of this, and the result was that there were four emerging themes which covered all of that data. As you can see, the four themes were membership, meeting style, sharing perception, and having a voice. And I would just like to take some time to address each of these in turn. When we first interviewed the project worker, she described how the Health Authority project was initially set up and how the steering group came about. In terms of recruiting members, she told us that she sent out approximately 100 adverts to various user and carer groups across the region, inviting inviting individuals to come along and become a member of the steering group. Unfortunately, from this 100 adverts, she got a very small response rate of seven, which is obviously a very minimal initial uptake. As a result of this, the health authority managers decided that they would use a purposive recruitment method, whereby they would contact users and carers that they'd contacted before, that they'd worked with in the past, and invite them to sit as members on the steering group. And from that point, the health authority relied on the members already recruited to then signpost them to other potential members. As well as this, there was what we as the researchers termed as an open membership approach. And this is whereby new members were encouraged to join the steering group, regardless of either the stage of the actual health authority project itself, or um, or the status of the individual. And what we mean by that is 
whether they were current or past users or carers. Now, these last few points are obviously critical, really, and they're a very major point, which I'm sure we'll come back to later on in the discussion, in that the steering group was intended to be representative of users and carers, as much as, as it can be. Um, and, and through this method of, of there being an open approach and uh, sort of purposive recruitment and then signposting to others, and that good membership mix couldn't be ensured. And several commentators, such as Gossard Miller and Forrest et al., have all commented that if there's not a good balance, then the outcome of that group will perhaps be of little use. The non-participant observations um, noted that there were two principal chairing styles used during the, um, during the meetings that were evaluated. The first of these being something called rotating chair. This is whereby users, carers and health authority managers were supposed to take it in turn to chair the meetings and this was to enforce the equal balance that, that was um, intended for the group. However, in practice we noticed that the managers chaired more meetings than the users and carers for, for various reasons. Um, and in particular we noticed that when one individual manager chaired, the meetings were far more chair dominated. Um, interestingly compared to the other, the other meetings either chaired by the users, carers or the other health authority managers where there was far more of a group discussion, which was obviously a, a, the key and a very important point for this project. We as the researchers had a hypothesis that as time progressed, the steering group members would become more confident and because of this they would uh, increase the number of contributions that they would make in the meetings. Um, as well as this, we thought that the training, which I'm going to discuss in a few moments, we thought that that would help them increase their confidence and contribute more as well. However, as, as is always the case, once, once we had this hypothesis, we found that the opposite was, was perhaps true, as uh, most people actually made fewer comments as time progressed. We were very interested in trying to find out the balance of responsibility of the steering group, because as I said earlier, it was intended that it was a very equal balance in that users and carers were on the same footing as the managers. However, what, what we found was that through the interviews with the users and carers, they reported to us that at several times they'd felt railroaded into certain decisions that were being made and to certain views that were being expressed. And on, on the same subject, we, when we actually interviewed the managers, they expressed the difficulty that they had in, in balancing uh, the need for members to be supported by the users and carers with the need for the members to feel ownership of the project. And that was a very hard balance to, to strike for the, for the managers. Regarding the reporting structure, we found that the health authority managers seemed unclear about how the work of the steering group was going to feed back into the commissioning process of the health authority. That's obviously a very interesting point which some of you may like to um, discuss with us later on. During the evaluation, we found that there was a total of one and a half days training taking place, um, addressing the subjects of assertiveness as well as group process. However, since the evaluation concluded, we have been informed that there have been another two days since that time. The steering group noticed over time, as the steering group was existing, and basically as awareness of the steering group was increasing, that there was a rise in the number of request, requests sorry, for representation from external bodies. This is obviously a very, very um, encouraging aspect for the, for the steering group, as that was, that was what they were there to do. However, despite this, there were several barriers to good working, and the first of these being the working practices of the external bodies that were requesting representation. And what I mean by this is a point that Alan raised slightly earlier about the need for there to be comfort breaks in meetings as well as for users and carers to attend meetings in pairs rather than individually. And they said to us that they, they liked this approach because it, it gave them a support network and they could support each other through, through the experience. 
Another barrier was documentary consultation, which was attempted by one organisation. Um, sorry, I think I've... Oh, no, sorry, the slide's OK. Um, yes, with, with documentary consulta consultation, an organisation sent a document to the steering group and asked the users and carers for comments um, and gave a certain time period for them to reply in. However, what we found, which is an important point to consider for all future involvement, is that users and carers actually needed a longer period of time to digest the information and to therefore decide about what comments and feedback they wanted to give. And also the need for plain English, which was quite an important point with documents. Another very encouraging point of the steering group was the very good links that they'd made with organisations such as the local implementation groups and the local implementation teams. And this took, um, the, the, the way this happened was that user and carers attended these meetings and represented the views of, of that group. However, what we did find, which was an interesting finding, was that there were actually very few active users and carers. And what we mean by this is that there are very few who were actually attending these external meetings. The result of this being that each of those active members had a very heavy workload, which, um, which wasn't a particular benefit, and it also posed the potential problem of burnout for those, for those individuals. The final point on this slide is about the independence from health authorities. And this is what users and carers felt was absolutely essential if the views of the steering group and if the outcomes were to be as efficient as possible and as effective. Um, they didn't want to be influenced by the health authority and to this end that they thought um, changes to the structure and also the financing of the steering group would benefit this. Referring back to what Alan mentioned earlier about the levels of involvement as, as mentioned in Goss and Miller, we decided that the steering group reflected listening and responsive level, which if you remember was the second from top, with the top being partnership. And just to explain, the reason why we didn't think the steering group reflected that top level of partnership was that there wasn't really an equal balance of power and status between the users, carers and the managers. And this is really what's needed if, if partnership is going to, is going to um, be successful. We also found that there was a certain ambiguity in the role of the steering group with some members um, seeing it as an opportunity to have a county-wide impression of how to engage users and carers, whereas others had the opportunity, uh, had the opinion that it, the steering group was there to address specific services and particular problems with services and to discuss possible improvements to those. And that obviously caused a slight conflict. Regarding collaboration, there have been several people, and you also saw on the, um, on the videotape that you saw earlier, that several people think that users should be in a separate group from carers, and also sometimes that users and carers should be separated from health authority managers. However, um, what we found from the project was that it worked very well in this instance. The main reason we thought was that both groups seemed incredibly eager for the project to succeed, that obviously overcame a lot of other p potential difficulties. However, having said that, there, there was a negative aspect of the collaboration, which was that some of the users and carers found that health authority managers sometimes um, worked at too fast a pace. However, during the evaluation period, this was mentioned to the managers and, and was sorted out. The results from our evaluation obviously led us to make several recommendations. <clears throat> and these, the ones on this slide here, are, are just the main recommendations that, that we made. The first is that you need strategic recruitment. And this is whereby you can ensure as representative as possible a sample in, in your steering group and also maintain control over the makeup of the group. A forum structure, we think, would, would certainly benefit the steering group of this nature, as instead of having one large group, as we did when we evaluated the, the, the project, you would have several smaller groups, um, each with obviously fewer members. Our rationale behind that was that several of the users and carers reported that 
although they felt slightly uncomfortable in the one steering group, they would actually have perhaps been better off and also contributed more had there been less people in, in the group. So we think that would certainly help in future. The project worker is a role that we haven't really mentioned that much to date, um, but they formed a, a fundamental part of the project, and this position evaluated very well by all concerned. Um, what they did, they provided a link between the users and carers and the health authority, although a problem that the project worker had was that it was a part-time position, and it was felt that it was very hard to actually achieve all of the work that was necessary in that time, so we think that that should be looked at and addressed in future. The final point on the slide that I'd like to conclude with is that there should be explicit good practice guidelines um, disseminated by steering groups and by user care groups and by the health authorities, and that they should be disseminated to all organisations that may want to have representation on their groups. Um, in terms of things like um, the comfort breaks, attending in pairs, the need for longer periods of time in general when involving users and carers. And we, we, we are sure that um, if those good guidelines are disseminated at the start, then it, it can really help the procedure along. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alan and, and Andy, for the um, presentation. Um, we're now going to move to the discussion. And for, just to remind people that are, have been watching, uh, the uh, presentation that they can participate in the discussion either through phoning 01752 233 646 or alternatively emailing tvstudio at plymouth.ac.uk. Anyway, I would like to start the discussion off by maybe turning to uh, Mary with a, a particular question in terms of actually setting up a project of, of this kind. Um, how do you actually go about and set it up in terms of the complexity of that of involving service users? Right. Well, I mean, this was part of trying to achieve the recommendations of the NSF across the region. And so there was managerial support from the very top with each strategic health authority being accountable for testing one particular element and reporting to others in an action learning set. And uh, South and West Devon was given the opportunity, uh, didn't have much choice in this opportunity, I think it's fair to say, that they were to get users and carers involved in influencing um, what was purchased in the service and in particular to look at quality initiatives. So in fact there was that huge support from the top to drive this forward. It became clear that if you did that without evaluation that there would be nothing really to feed back into the action learning set across the region to give people guidelines for the future. Mm. I think that gave us a very tight timetable and you've already heard that we would have liked to have taken two years to do the evaluation, but in terms of what else was going on with NHS uh, developments, that wasn't feasible. The people that tend to feel able to come and articulate um, and influence these kind of um, opportunities tend to be people who've either had a very bad experience or a very good experience of uh, mental health services and therefore, by very definition, are not representative. And though that's very clear across the literature, we didn't feel we really got a, an age range. For example, I mean, we had no adolescent contributor. And I think that would have been completely inappropriate in a group size of what was often 15. But if you were to move to a forum where you looked particularly at what are the needs for um, adolescents in, in mental health service, you could run that group very differently. So I think really and truly what we found from this is that it is over ambitious to be all inclusive and that you have got to focus down on particular types of service and we didn't um, attempt in this to look at services for older people with uh, dementia for example we said that was outside the um, the project but I really do feel that the results from this project indicate the amount of work the health authority put in to trying to get it right and right the way through, um, we had to be very careful 
not to get too engaged with either the, the uh, service users or the health authority because I think one of the dangers of this kind of action research where you're really in there listening is that um, you go native and take either the health authority's side or the users and carers side about what's going to happen mm. and I, th I think both Andy and, um, and Alan would say that there were once or twice in terms of my supervision of them because remember they were out there in the field collecting this data once or twice I had to come back and say you are researchers you're not a mental health nurse and you're not a member of the population trying to influence services our job is to observe and I, I noticed once or twice Andy used the phrase um, that you noticed and I was desperate to kind of come in and say actually observed and that that was the difference you were there as a research uh, rather than as a member of the group. So you can see that was quite tense at times. I mean, there's a question here just coming from uh, Ray Jones in Plymouth um, about the costs of involving um, carers and users and, a, and a, a sort of question about how do we actually judge whether it's, it's worth the, all, the, all the complexity? I think that's a, a very fair question from a health economist and I think at the moment uh, the NSF is implying that the decision has already been taken that the cost-benefit analysis is worth it. I think this was quite a costly project uh, for the health authority. It did pay people's travel and time to attend, which of course I think is essential because a lot of these people are on very low incomes or benefits. But I think what we've illustrated is is that such big groups probably aren't cost-effective, that it's more important to focus on particular services with smaller groups. Thank you. Um, I'll just turn to you a minute, Andy, in, in terms of um, the actual, some of the, the, the methodological um, issues. Um, the period, you, you actually, um, throughout the period of the research, you, you, you introduced these, uh, this idea of sociograms. I mm. um, wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how that actually, um, how, how it worked and some of the, um, the sort of benefits of using that kind of approach and some of the difficulties maybe of using that. Sure, kind of sure, approach. okay. Um, I mean, as, as I think Alan said earlier, the sociograms were there to record the group dynamics of the group. And ob obviously that, that's what you're there to observe in the non-participant non observation capacity. You are there to observe the interactions of the group and how that really works. And it's something that you just couldn't get from things like group minutes alone. So I think that's a very valuable tool. In terms of what the sociograms were, Alan mentioned it briefly in that it was a graphical representation of, of the group meeting, which it certainly was. Just to, just to explain that, what, what actually happens is that you literally just draw um, an oblong and just give every member of the meeting, everybody that's attended, a number around the table. And then throughout the meeting, you you draw basically lines between people as they interact. So say for instance, if Tony asked me a question, there would be an arrow going from Tony to myself. There would also be an indication of how long that was, whether it was a short or a medium or a long question or comment. Um, obviously, indicating the length just gives you an extra dimension and it just gives you something else which is, is very useful when you're analysing this data rather than just saying you spoke to me it's really quite useful to say was it a short comment or a long comment. By the end of the meeting what you get is, is a diagram that's, that's full of lines and it's actually it, it's quite, it's, it is complex to actually, um, to actually analyse the, these diagrams but it's certainly worth persevering with it. Um, what it shows, it shows who's dominating, it also shows who's reticent in talking and who stays very quiet. Um, and for instance, as I said, in terms of we saw certain meetings were chair dominated, that's obviously very easy to see from something like a sociogram because you can see there's arrows going from one person to all of the others and then it's not reciprocated. And I, I just think it's a very, very useful tool and something that you certainly couldn't get by any other method. Do you think there's any tensions between um, the use of the sociogram where mm. there's obviously a, an inclusion of all the people that's involved and the interview structure which is far more selective in terms of the numbers of people that are involved? Well I, I think that 
these methods aren't exclusive. I think you have to use them together. You have to use them jointly. They give mm. you very, very different data, and all of it is, is very useful data. Obviously, as I've said, the, the sociograms give you the, the idea of the actual dynamics of a meeting. The interviews, the one-on-one -on -one interviews, obviously you can delve much deeper into individuals' perspectives, and you can really get an idea of of their thoughts and, and their opinions about any of that. I don't know if you want to come well, in. Well, I was just thinking, mm. weren't we also able to follow up through our interview schedule exactly the, mm. the, the results of the sociograms, um, which was very interesting, particularly about the way that group yeah. members felt about the chairing mm. process? Yeah, mm. sure. Because I, mean, I, think, I think that's really important, that they were sequential, mm. that you observed mm. the meetings, mm. took your sociograms down as an accurate record of mm. observation, and then used that data to help us uh, design the interview schedule which we tested as, as you saw earlier in this clip um, with a user who uh, and from there we were therefore building our knowledge mm -hmm. over um, a period of time well I think that's a nice lead on I'd like to turn to Alan if I, I could to, to talk about another sort of issue of method in terms of non-participate non-participant <laughs> observation um, and do, do you feel that the, the, the process of non-participant observation actually influenced the, the group process in any way? Do, do you feel well, it was a true account? I mean, that's hard to answer because obviously we weren't there when, uh, uh, you know, if we, if we could have, um, you know, it, when we weren't there, if you see what I mean. Um, but what, mm. we, um, what we established was that observing the group was challenging for the group members and on day one um, we really noticed how um, this had affected the confidence maybe of some of the members uh, to speak um, and that's when we had those discussions at the end of the meeting in terms of adapting our approach and, and we had to adapt our approach by um, limiting the number of research researchers that were in the room observing and we decided to opt for the minutes of the meetings to support um, the content almost of the discussion. Um, it was also um, important for us to enable Andy to tr constantly reassure um, uh, the members of the group um, that he, you know, he, he was there on genuine purpose as an independent um, researcher. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say anything more? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I could categorically say that over the time they certainly became more relaxed with, with my presence. The first meeting, it was very, very obvious that they weren't comfortable. They were very rigid, um, and some of them were obviously holding back with comments that they wanted to say. Over time, as, as Alan said, we, we adapted with what they wanted so that I then attended on my own. And over the next few meetings, it was obvious that they were becoming far more natural in, in, their, in their mannerisms and in their interactions and everything. Um, part of that was because I interact with them socially in breaks in the meetings as well. I think that really <coughs> helped. Mm. Although I must say that you do need to keep distance, obviously, in non-participant mm. observation. You don't want to become part of the group. And that's where we got that supervision from Mary, yes. which was constantly trying to say, OK, we know this job is tricky in terms of <coughs> observing, and it's always important mm. to hold back mm. that kind of, um, mm. you know, the ability of getting mm. too close. Maybe. I, I think it's really important that this is quite a vulnerable group mm. who are prepared to uh, expose themselves to health authority managers, but then to also expose themselves to evaluation. Mm. I mean, we did, mm. I want to be very clear, we had ethical approval mm. and uh, informed consent from all members, but in an ideal world you'd have probably videoed this and brought mm. it back and mm. broken it mm. down. That's completely unacceptable with mm. a group of people mm. who may um, be paranoid, may have, um, you know, long-term enduring mental illness, that you cannot guarantee every time they mm. come to a group that they will be well. Mm. And believe me, there weren't always all of them. Mm. Sure. So there are those issues also that um, mm. are hard for health authority managers to manage. Mm. I'd like to follow up on that. We've got a, a, a sort of principal question, I think, coming from John Rawlinson in, in Plymouth, um, who who's, who's poses the question that, that the reference to users and carers or users and carers um, is, is kind of in the discussion coming through as if there's some sort of concordance between the views of carers and users. Um, and would you sort of recognise or um, that there were quite or could be quite different stances um, from, from users and carers within, um, in, in, with respect to mental health service and their use? Uh, 
I mean, I'd certainly like to take that question because um, I think often they are fundamentally opposed. I mean, we know the National Schizophrenia Society that largely represents carers would like more inpatient beds, and we know that Mind Speak Out says that's the last thing the average young person with a history of schizophrenia wants, mm. i.e. an inpatient bed. So I completely agree with John. I think we have to remember that our job is to evaluate something that the health authority mm. wanted to set up. But our recommendation is that in focus groups, you would often want to listen to those two groups separately, i.e. users and carers separately. Hey, I'm Can I just add to just to that? Because, Andy, I don't know if you'd agree, there was a difference in the membership makeup of the group. And I think we put the numbers that were there, but there was an imbalance, and that's something we've highlighted in the sure. report. Sure. Just to move on slightly, because I, I, I'm, you see, I suppose we, on this kind of general theme of of who controls the the process, um, at one point you you acknowledged that there was a uh, a perception that there was a, a lack of managerial control over mm -hmm. the group membership, mm -hmm. and this was a problem. Um, was it a problem, or who was it a problem for? <laughs> well, it was, it was really a problem for us as the evaluators, really. I mean, we, we saw that the, the, way they, the way the health authority and the steering group as a whole viewed it was that the more people they could get onto the group, the better it would be. Um, but because of this, when we, when we interviewed, particularly the project worker, and we asked, um, the question of, okay, what is the split between users and carers? Because we were interested in the different views that the two the two different groups may have, they they just weren't they weren't sure of 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 the split. So obviously, from that point of view, they they didn't know the makeup of the group. And I think the makeup of the group could be quite important in terms of the results that come out of it, in terms of how valid you know that those outcomes are. So I think, I think the fact that it was a problem, we saw it as a problem rather than the health authority managers. But then when we interviewed them, they fully admitted that perhaps it, it, you know, they, they, they could know more than they did. If, mm. It's a rather clumsy way of putting well, it. Well, and also it was almost decided right from the very beginning that there wouldn't be a strategic approach for membership. Mm. Um, it, it, it was almost who we've been, been we're working with in the past, we will now bring together rather than thinking, you know exactly how should the, mm. the membership be made up and, 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 and so forth. Mm. I mean, I think one of the things was that it was meant to be an influencing group and yet there were times when the participants expected the health authority to be able to act much more quickly yeah. and to change mm. services mm. Uh, radically and the trouble was that there wasn't always um, harmonious approach to what needed changing amongst that group. So, I mean, I can remember us discussing that, you know, one group, a small group very much wanted intense personal psychotherapy, which we know some of the NICE guidelines indicate, you know, should be time limited in terms of cost effectiveness. But there didn't, the project workers were not sufficiently au fait with some of that research to feel confident to say, We've heard that and now we need to move on to mm. something else. So we often kind of kept reiterating. There didn't seem to be a clear structure for closure. Okay. Mm. I've got a question uh, just coming on the telephone from uh, Ray again. I'm just going to field this to you. Um, Hi. Um, uh, just picking up on the point in the recommendations about the, the forum and also the, your sort of response to, to John's point about um, sort of users and carers. How are you going to deal with um, if you then split up is into smaller groups? If you then got sort of several groups, how do you then synthesise sort of the findings or, or the decisions and the decision making between the smaller groups? It seems to me a bit of a problem. How do you do that? I mean, there's clearly got to be a coordinator at health authority level that brings these results in and looks strategically across um, Devon and Cornwall. I completely agree, you can't just do everything at a local level, but some things can be done more swiftly by testing um, at a local level initially. The, the great problem will be if there is no harmony with uh, results from individual forum groups, uh, and I think that's quite likely in some respects. 
And I mean, the point is, this work is really hard, and that's why people haven't done mm. it before. And I don't mean the research is hard. I mean, actually changing what is delivered in the service is extremely hard in these areas that are not as clear-cut as waiting lists, for example, where I think you, know, you could ask a representative population, and most people want to be able to have a hip replacement within six months. But within this group, they're not able to articulate similar desires necessarily from services, which is extremely hard to manage. It is a good question because we, we also observed that groups from different geographical areas behaved differently and worked mm -hmm. at a different pace. Um, some groups were working at quite, quite a speed and were, felt mm -hmm. very confident about um, how they um, liaised and linked with the health authority. But other groups were in slight disarray and, okay. and uh, had some real problems working with the health authority for various reasons mm -hmm. and, and some very good reasons were mm -hmm. cited in terms of maybe an imbalance of how various groups and forums were um, supported financially. If I can pick up on that, I just had two questions um, in from Torbay. Um, the first one sort of um, poses the question about getting feedback from the, um, the users following the uh, evaluation project, if I'm allowed to call it a project. Um, how did they, if you did um, achieve uh, f um, some feedback from um, service users, did they find that a harrowing experience or was it something they found actually empowering? We've, what, what's happened so far is we've delivered the report to the health authority and it's also been fed back to the people that worked on the project with us, i.e. Mm -hmm. every user and carer that was interviewed or part of the project is aware of the mm -hmm. results and ha has in effect signed off the report as um, a fair representation of what happened. The next level of work that we're talking to the health authority about is to work with key people in each uh, local improvement team to see how that can be furthered in the way that's being asked by this person from Torbay. Uh, but due to changes in structures, that has been held up, mm. not from the university's perspective, though. Okay, um, does anybody want to add on it? Um. No, but I mean, throughout um, our research evaluation period, um, what, what one of the other important issues was to constantly update the steering group of the progress mm -hmm. of the research project and uh, that's where our attendance at um, um, the steering group meetings were, um, were kind of uh, opportunities yeah. to um, offer um, literature kind of feedback mm -hmm. and summaries on the progress of the, of the project. Right. I mean I think, I think, sorry if I could just carry on with that just mm -hmm. slightly mm -hmm. more. Um, I mean, they, they certainly found it very useful that I, because I was there, they always put a slot in the agenda for me to feedback what we'd done since the mm. last steering group meeting. Mm. Um, you know, sometimes that was thanking people for participating in the interviews and giving not, not, um, not complete data because at that stage you hadn't analysed it, but I think it was important we could just pick out a few mm. key themes that were coming out just so they could then go away and discuss it. They found that quite interesting to do. Um, but even if I didn't have anything particular to say, I think they mm. found it very helpful just to be, be in the loop, if you like, and they certainly, I think it made them feel more part of the research mm. rather than subjects of our evaluation, which I think was certainly helpful to them. Okay. Well, I've got two punchline questions, really, just, just um, uh, arrived. Um, one from Tor Bay and, and one from uh, Mira McCullum in Plymouth, and they both basically asked the same thing about what, what impact do you, do you feel that the evaluation report has had on user care involvement so far? <laughs> well, we think, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're very proud of our, our project and our evaluations and we've got some really good recommendations and we feel it's now time for the Strategic Health Authority to decide how uh, they want to use this, uh, this, this evaluation. I would pick up on that, that we've all already um, done some national uh, work at presenting a paper at a national conference. We will hope to publish, and we've certainly got papers in train, but the most overriding thing, I believe, is that out of this work will come a recognition that you have to pay users and carers to do this work, to make it legitimate, and that 
you must train the managers mm -hmm. in people management skills and those those skills are different to managing a meeting with 12 people in a health authority 12 users and carers work at a different pace in a different way and you've got to be more flexible mm. and so I believe that this project is a cornerstone in developing a stronger partnership voice between users and carers and that we would very much hope to go on and further test it at a, another level to see whether we can actually go through perhaps a longitudinal study to see how services actually change in the light of the equal voice. But what we did discover was achieving that equal voice is much more difficult than health authority managers thought at the beginning. No, I think, um, I think now's, now's the opportunity also for the project worker um, to take up some of the key recommendations and uh, you know, to engage um, the steering group to think about maybe um, the way the structure of using care involvement is in the in the southwest. I've got um, a, a question I suppose for clarification here from John Rawlinson in Plymouth. Um, in the process of the the research process um, it's um, basically sounded as if there were groups of managers and groups of, of uh, carers and users. In the process of evaluation did you look at those people, different groups, different individuals separately uh, and was there any sharing of perceptions um, overall? I'm not sure that I quite understand the question. We obviously did break down um, interview responses into different groups and all members that were part of this review have had a full copy of the report. So um, all users know the results of the interviews with managers and mm. vice versa. So it's been much more open mm. in the feedback um, than I think any project I've ever been involved mm. with before at this point. And again, I think that shows the commitment and honesty of the Strategic Health Authority members who were interviewed, the willingness to share some mm. of their interview um, information, which was that they were quite anxious mm. or found things difficult mm. or felt they lost control. And those things are known by the users and carers with whom mm. they were working. So I think there's a lot of acceptance of self-disclosure that I think we should acknowledge is mm. a, a really mm. fundamental way forward in partnership working. So some of the shared view may be over the process rather than necessarily the opinions. Absolutely. Don't <coughs> um, just to move, move on, um, and in some ways return back to the, the questions of methods, um, you recommend um, a forum structure, a use of a forum structure. Um, it would be um, useful to, to understand some of the rationale for that recommendation and also how you might see it working. Right. I mean, if I can take up the first part of the question at least. Um, the rationale, as I touched on briefly, was that the users and carers, and um, many of them in their interviews with us, stated that the size of the group was a, um, quite a critical factor in, in their contributions to the group. Many of the users in particular found it um, a bit intimidating that the groups were so large. As Mary alluded to earlier, the groups were sometimes 15 members, sometimes even more than that. And I think for particularly the, the, the quieter members of the group, they found it very hard to, to get in on the conversation and to have the, the confidence to actually make a statement. And they, they said themselves, if the groups were smaller, they'd be far happier both in that setting, they'd feel more confident in themselves and they'd certainly feel happier about actually making contributions as well. So I think that's where it came mm. in about the size of the group was quite a fundamental point. Um, can I just add that in addition to that, we thought that the smaller forums could act as task groups as well, whereby they would be set specific tasks um, mm. to achieve and they might well be able to feed that back mm. and work more successfully. It might be, for instance, looking at a key guidance document. Mm. And in order to do that, uh, they would be able to achieve that in a smaller group mm -hmm. and be able to feed back in. Um, you know, I mean, there, there, were certain, there, were cer there certainly were a few task groups during the time that we evaluated as well. They, they went off to do particular things. Um, I remember at one point they were very keen to recruit more members because the, the membership had dropped quite low at one particular point. And because of that, they set up a task group and actually asked for 
I think there's only about four or five people on the group, mm. to go away and look at that issue. And then at the next steering group, they came back and reported to the whole group about you know, their views, and then they discussed those views with the rest of the steering group as well. And uh, there are several th instances like that, and I think they all found that very useful in just you know, basically drawing together ideas and then being able to discuss a far more concise view than maybe you get if it was discussed initially in the whole steering group. I mean, if, if you were going to make recommendations about um, the types of training to health authority members um, or health authority managers in terms of mm. how it would enable them to work more effectively with users and carers, what kinds of things would you suggest? Well, we'd certainly look to some um, health authority managers um, having the opportunity to do some of the courses that um, MIND and other organisations run to understand some of the issues of um, social exclusion and uh, reluctance to contribute uh, as a result perhaps of being labelled. So there are already some very good programmes around. But I, I think also it is that health authority managers who really conduct this kind of work do need a form of clinical supervision because it's fundamentally different to the rest of their day-to-day -day work. In addition, we felt that some training in terms of understanding group mm. dynamics mm. at times yeah. uh, w with, with the steering group and the size that the group was, and it was obvious looking at um, our sociograms, that um, chairing these meetings was, was, a, was a tricky task. And mm -hmm. there hadn't been any mm. um, pre-training mm. um, to help the health authority managers achieve mm. this. Mm. Um, for instance, you know, there were aspects mm. of, um, of of of, of um, the users and care representatives dominating, mm. or or not. Right. You know, as you say, we I got suppose it leads, it leads me into a sort of I think an important question because some of the things you're, you're suggesting now is that if you had your time again you might do some of these things slightly differently. Well, I hope so. Um, <laughs> is there any other, you know, if you were going to sort of sum up say, maybe two things that you would do differently next time, what would they be? I think certainly we wouldn't start with two researchers mm. at the first meeting even though we got ethical mm. approval for mm. that. Uh, okay. I, th I think that was a, a negative beginning that took some undoing in yeah. terms of relationship yeah. building. Yeah. And I think, secondly, we would wish to have had a longer period to do a longitudinal study. Right. Um, thank you for that. I, I think it's um, time to uh, thank our uh, panel members, Andy, Mary and um, Alan, plus the uh, people that have been in the uh, variety of studio settings that have sent in um, questions to this um, very interesting discussion about user um, and care involvement in the evaluation of mental health services. Um, before I actually finish today's um, seminar, I'd like to just remind people of uh, the, the next uh, seminars in this series. The, this will be on the 12th of June. Um, the first one that day is at midday, which is communication in health. The second one that on the same day is clinical outcome measurements in health, which is at two o'clock. Um, we would welcome your participation again uh, in, in those um, uh, seminars on that day. And please do involve as many people as you uh, come across in your working and other lives um, to also be involved. Anyway, um, it comes down to me to say uh, thank you very much from the studio and thank you to my colleagues. Um, Thank you very much.